Venture Startup Spotlight, the podcast where we dive into innovative startups shaping the future. I'm your host, Mark, and today we're tackling a critical question, and that is some of the ethical challenges that founders face in deep tech and robotics. And I'm very happy to be here together with Daniela from Sofia, from Theo from Unicorn Labs, and this is from Sepsiscan. So uh, let me allow you to introduce yourself, Daniela. Hello, Mark. My name is Daniele. I'm from Brazil and I'm representing Sofia. Uh, my background is business. I work all my life in business area and market and all kind of this issue. And the beginning of this year, I start doing something different. I quickly my job and I start uh, with doing something that was very important to my life and help other people, other people's life. And I know this 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 project that uh, start in Recife with some teachers and specialists, and they trying to solve some uh, one of the biggest problem in the world, which is the problem health, uh, mental health. So you know that health of population must have or must have some problem mental health health issues and our tool trying to help the healthcare system because with this collapse uh, the healthcare the doctors and the healthcare system cannot be able to handle with this large pandemic we call it a pandemic and uh, Zofia trying to help uh, all the the journey of the healthcare patient to be more quickly and assertive in all pro, all diagnosis, uh, all journey of their diagnosis, and in the consultation of the doctor and the the patient, our to record the the patient speech, and shows to the doctor or the healthcare professional a, a score lower or high risk that that person have some disease or, or some disorders. And we start with if schizophrenia, we intend to finish schizophrenia these years. In the next year, we start to deal with depression and burnout. Okay, well, that's a lot of stuff there. Thank you. And also a brave move to go from corporate to, uh, to founder. But let's dive into that later on. Theo. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Theo, I'm from Greece. Uh, I represent Unicorn Labs, uh, which is uh, uh, an AI-powered application that detects uh, Alzheimer's in very early, early stage through voice. Um, I have a background in AI. I started my career about 12 years ago, um, and uh, I worked as a developer, a software engineer, uh, for many years, I moved to the Netherlands, and uh, I think uh, this was the catalyst, the opportunity to pursue uh, this dream that I had. Um, we started uh, about a year ago. Um, we developed uh, the model, and uh, with the help of uh, Startup Bootcamp in the last few weeks, uh, we were able to uh, give it um, uh, a substance. Okay, thank you. This is... Hey, so my name is Didis and I'm uh, co-founder of Sepsiscan, a uh, medtech startup based in Riga, Latvia. And uh, we're building medical imaging uh, device that is used by um, uh, hospital intensive care unit uh, staff uh, for treating sepsis patients. And uh, the journey, how we got to actually start up, uh, began um, already a while ago. Uh, my professional uh, path actually initially was in marketing after five years uh, working for uh, also large corporates like Unilever, later uh, actually joined as a partner also at small advertising agency. And then uh, along with uh, recession in 2010, the switch industries, and that's how I got actually into healthcare, uh, joining Johnson Johnson MDD as a sales manager for medical devices. And that was time when I got uh, more interested uh, uh, deep, deep, uh, dig deeper into uh, medical technologies as such, and uh, uh, it raised my curiosity in, in long term. Uh, later, uh, also uh, had the opportunity to work for large and smaller uh, technology companies, which eventually resulted uh, me in uh, becoming co-founder of a medical technology startup, which has joined the Startup Bootcamp program. So happy to be here. Well, great. And uh, I mean, the main question was about the 
regulatory and ethical challenges that we anticipate. And uh, the, all three of you are actually in the medical thing of deep tech. And I think it's hard enough to be a founder. I think that you can relate to that. And then you dive into a, a, an industry that has a lot of uh, regulations and, and ethical problems. Can you tap in on this? Uh, of course. Yeah. Uh, like uh, we are deep tech because you are based on scientific field. So for uh, we are uh, develop moving forward very quickly this innovation part, especially in the medical field. And in our case, our biggest concern is about the patient's data. Uh, so we are very uh, concerned about that. And since the beginning, we are following all the rules uh, in Brazil called LGPD. Mm -hmm. And we are uh, very concerned about that. We start following these rules since the, our first clinical tests. And uh, you'll be more sensitive sensitive when you go to the market because the data you be in the in our tool so we, we were very careful about that and in our case we have another uh, uh, ethical committees in brazil that is a, a committee that's allowing you to go or no go to start our clinical tests so since the beginning we were approved by, by them and we start to follow all the rules uh, Another important thing is one of our co-founders is our psychiatrist, mm -hmm. Dr. João. He was part of this committee. So for us, it's very important to follow this regulation. And of course, we are dealing with lives. So we are very, uh, as we move forward with Sofia, we need to be very careful about this about this data, this information of the, the patients, it also with the uh, ethics committee also. And this is, I mean, if we talk about we're dealing with life, I think uh, you're now having a solution that actually taps in, into that. So what do you see as regulatory or ethical problems with your device that you have now? Uh, well, uh, since we uh, are uh, actually university spin-off, we can uh, compare what are uh, what's the attitude uh, probably of regulatory instances and uh, uh, those institutions involved in the uh, regulatory path uh, for any company in trying to develop new technology and um, get to the market. And it's interesting compare uh, that uh, uh, while we were still part of university uh, project, uh, the, I would say um, it was the access to hospitals and patients uh, to do um, any trial and uh, demo on uh, real patients was uh, comparatively easier than it's now when we are uh, already working as an independent legal entity as a uh, startup uh, now uh, first uh, we uh, are um, asked to pay specific additional fee actually to implement any activities in comparison uh, with um, any hospital which is basically a formal <laughs> let's say um, financial burden I would say uh, from one side. From another side, we have to start from uh, scratch uh, all the uh, approval uh, process uh, with the authorities in order to get uh, confirmation from ethics committee and uh, have all the protocol in place, even though it was already uh, prepared uh, within a uh, university project scope. So um, from that perspective, we, th we see that uh, we need uh, actually to put quite uh, a lot of energy in, uh, and uh, effort in order to prepare all the documentation and be uh, uh, and for regulatory path to be in uh, place so that's uh, aligned with legislation, all the requirements. And yeah, um, that's uh, how to say interesting uh, just in insight and uh, conclusion you get when, when you start doing something on your own, what is being uh, cleared already by university. Absolutely. I think you all, and of course you have to, you have to abide to these regulatory things and you have mm -hmm. to look at the ethical problems. But so, so maybe let's mm -hmm. zoom out a little bit because Funny enough, we now talk about, this is about deep tech and robotics, and we talk about AI a lot, right? The two of you actually are actively using that. Maybe not all three of it, actually. So uh, I would say five years ago, AI was deep tech, and now it's almost like a commodity already, right? The same with the microphone that we're using now. That used to be about a decade ago, no, not a decade, let's say half a century ago, this was deep tech, and now it's just a microphone that everybody uh, knows. So where would you think this, this, this is going? So when is AI more than just a algorithm. Uh, what I'm saying here is sometimes people say we're using AI and what they're using is just an algorithm or just a calculation. 
So Theo, I know you are also in the AI space. What for you is the difference between true AI and just an algorithm that's been, let's say, pimped up to be called AI? I think we have to differentiate between AI and machine learning uh, because these two uh, terms are used very weirdly lately. Um, machine learning is used, uh, it's basically everywhere, um, from this microphone to um, to anything. And uh, I think the term machine learning and uh, the algorithms that um, it has, or that um, use machine learning, um, will be used everywhere uh, in the next few years, um, from medical to entertainment to um, pretty much everything. Uh, the term artificial intelligence, which is used more for uh, natural language processing and uh, uh, generation, um, I think this is a, a gimmick. Uh, this is something that will be either um, become one tool uh, that will um, encompass everything, or it will be surpassed by other machine learning al algorithms. Okay. But Daniela, I know that you are combining, um, let's say, current AI with, uh, I would almost call it old fashioned, but it's not old fashioned, like the standard mathematics. And even if you, I mean, if you're not being in the university, that might be not standard, but you guys are combining two things. Why did you choose to do that next to uh, developing an app? In our vision, Mark, uh, AI, of course, is very important to, and help us to do a lot of things uh, but we know also that ii classic uh, works very well and predictable situation like when you talked about uh, driveless cars or other things the ai classic works very well but when you talked about disease about real lives uh, our solution and our specialist mathematics uh, the main the main point here, like you said, we combine AI classic more mathematics, which is uh, give some patterns uh, to the patient speech. So you don't use only AI, but you put another glass, uh, another layer to see uh, different types of the disease, like AI classic see on one shape and with our methodology, with our mathematics, you can see different shapes of the same person, the same speech, the patient speech. Okay. And this is, if you look at, uh, because this is about the ethical uh, uh, problems, I know if you have a device that looks at uh, skin, maybe there's a difference between a certain type of skin or maybe the color of a skin. And then you of course need to make sure that anything that you do now doesn't uh, hit boundaries there. How do you go about that when you're inventing in the industry that you're doing? Uh, sure, that's uh, one of the challenges for engineering team uh, to um, develop technology which is uh, relevant and applicable for uh, different types of skin and uh, also uh, for uh, uh, different uh, specific, uh, let's say, use cases probably which are uh, comparatively rare within population. And uh, in this case, uh, I, I would say that's a combination of, uh, in, in our case, of optics, uh, uh, electronics, uh, software, and also uh, with the additional module of uh, artificial intelligence, which would enable, uh, in our case, additional functionality in future. So uh, from uh, ethic, ethics perspective, I would say uh, we are more ac actually uh, focused uh, or uh, the uh, there are some issues related to data acquisition or since we are taking image uh -huh. uh, of uh, the patient's tissue uh, some uh, some part of uh, our uh, the patients are likely to be uh, unconscious in uh, uh, intensive care units so it's about uh, uh, the proper uh, protocol of uh, acquiring uh, let's say data uh, without uh, a patient being able to uh, give his or her uh, confirmation. However, of course, we would do that according to each hospital's uh, rules uh, and uh, regulations in a proper way. However, uh, another thing is regarding uh, data storage and uh, the, the processing afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and here, it's actually uh, even a broader, uh, I would say, issue related to uh, location of uh, patient's data, whether it's within boundaries of a country where uh, this uh, data is uh, um, 
acquired and also collected uh, since so no, uh, nowadays it, uh, almost it's uh, assumed that the basic component of uh, uh, IT systems is uh, is also cloud infrastructure mm -hmm. so the question is about where where this cloud is actually uh, located and uh, if uh, there isn't any breach of uh, uh, data transmission in the sense of sharing this outside boundaries of specific countries. So I would say in our case, we have to pay attention uh, uh, in several dimensions. So it's about the yeah. acquisition, patient's approval, and then uh, also uh, data management. Okay. Yeah, because if you look at the regulatory yeah. part of things, um, if you, for example, if we zoom out a little bit and we take open AI, right there and now, the, 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 it's called the alignment problem where you say AI cannot harm uh, people and hence they have certain boundaries that if you ask AI a uh, super question like, can we solve the uh, greenhouse gas emissions by removing everybody from the world, like all the humans, then OpenAI will say, sorry, I cannot answer that question. There are, by the way, modes in OpenAI that will answer that question and also other platforms in AI that do not have these boundaries. What I'm saying here is that internally, um, I mean, in Europe, we have this uh, AI Regulation Act, right? But already, OpenAI is using internal people to make some choices of what they will answer and what they will not do. You guys in your industry, of course, have these regulatory offices that also guide you. But do you also think about internally, what, this is something that we can do, but we will not do because it's non-ethical. So, Theo, is there anything on your innovation path that you would say, I will, might not go. You don't have to give the example. Just, I, I'm just wondering, do you have somebody internally that helps you on those ethical questions? Um, this come back, comes back to how we operate. Um, I think um, because we are operating in a very specific field and uh, we have a very specific model that does only one thing. Uh, we don't have the problem OpenAI has that tries to do everything. So um, from... An AI standpoint, uh, our model does one thing, and that's it. So there is no ethical problem there. Okay. And how is that with you, Daniela? In our opinion, Mark, uh, we are a tool. So since the beginning, we struggling and we discussed in about a lot of about if our tool could be uh, able to have. To, to be in the hands of the patient or only with some professional uh, to guide this type of conversation and see the results. Uh, so we believe uh, the AI and our tool cannot be uh, used by our the, the patient because the, the, the mental health pro problems are very sensitive and in our opinion must to be used the patient with some professional that have the the information and the extra instruction to help their patient so for us is is in this moment you can change yeah. but in this moment uh, our tool is to help care professional not only to use only for the your, the, the patient. Right, so that's already your your uh, your boundaries there. Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, you have a, uh, a handheld device and you're thinking about the industry. Uh, if you look at, for example, 3D printing, right? That seems very cool because you can print your own cup, but all of a sudden you can also print your own gun and that's in plastic and nobody will detect it. So is there anything, Is there are there any worries that you see in this deep tech robotics industry where you say, this this needs to be regulated because else if it falls into the wrong hands things might go wrong. Uh, sure, uh, I, I think the, in our case and also uh, probably in the uh, case of uh, some other similar and basically medical technologies as such, it, it is the degree of um, uh, basically confidence you put in the results of the device that uh, you get as a professional uh, to base your um, uh, how to say um, your, uh, your con conclusion or decision on patients' treatment. In our sense, we uh, aim to uh, 
can say position our device with very um, down to earth, uh, let's say clinical claims, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which suggest that, uh, for instance, our technology should be used as complementary uh, decision making tool instrument, which provides specific data, but which uh, still a human a doctor needs to evaluate and assess as part of uh, more uh, comprehensive data set and uh, let's say vital sign parameters which are provided by other uh, panels with this uh, i would say that uh, uh, there's definitely increasing role of ai and uh, uh, different technologies uh, being used more and more within the daily routine of uh, hospitals and uh, doctors but uh, uh, there is still extent of uh, this human intervention and experience that cannot be substituted. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that that's relevant not only uh, for, for our technology, uh, which is basically used to guide treatment uh, uh, and uh, which is related basically to prevention of mor a patient's mortality. Mm -hmm. Like the, the most, uh, how to say, uh, significant uh, um, uh, Effect. Gain, uh, effect yeah. or gain uh, that this could be uh, achieved by applying our technology. So we have to be really careful about what we uh, say to healthcare professionals and what we promise that can be achieved with the tech from one side. Uh, but from other side, yes, we uh, uh, have to be uh, also confident and have arguments with any claims we go uh, outside uh, when, when, when actually doing demos with our technology and uh, making tests on patients. So, okay, I also want to have your view on maybe some regulations or some ethical stuff goes too far. And I'm going to use, I'm going to borrow an example that happened to me last week. And it's about AI, but it's also it can be also applicable to deep tech and robotics. But so Apple introduced their new iPhone, and uh, me as a techie, right, I was really enthusiastic about it. So I thought, yeah, now we finally have Apple AI. But of course, the European Union says, well, we have a couple of regulations, and hence Apple said, you know what? Here's your new phone, but the new cool feature you don't have it yet, right? So for me, I would say that is going too far. I already use OpenAI. Why am I restricted on my new phone to have that with the button? But it, of course, it's not a world problem that we're solving here, but I'm just looking to see what are your views on that you think sometimes regulations go too far in this industry. Daniela, maybe you can answer that first. Yeah, we are not dealing with uh, uh, this part yet because you, we are only in the clinical tests. But when you ask uh, other question, I, I remember that we intend to go to B2B market, like a company like Startup Bootcamp can use our tool to un understand how is the health mental condition of their, their co-workers. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the other hand, you can think in, thinking about how the company is going to use this information because could be better good to the co-work if the company is real uh, concerned about the issue, but if the company is not, could be a, a, a bad situation to the, the, the co-worker. So uh, we, are, we are not uh, str struggling with this part yet, Mark, but we are thinking about how you can explain uh, uh, um, to be more go to the, the other markets mm -hmm. uh, like uh, companies and other things not only to the government or companies uh, but in the other hand you have some kind of problems of regulation and could be a risk for Zofia if you, we, we allowed this type of uh, company use our tool okay yeah, so this is, what is your view on regulations that sometimes go too far? I would say uh, from uh, actually academic research perspective, since um, I'm also involved uh, in addition to activities related to start also uh, as a program manager at university, uh, 
for the course uh, application digital health. And one of the issues we have faced is regarding uh, access uh, to uh, uh, data sets that can be used for uh, basically educational purposes or simulations, even uh, in an uh, anonymized uh, format. And uh, I believe this relates from one side to GDPR regulation, which puts some uh, restrictions on sharing sensitive data. But uh, it's really um, tough to get any kind of data set from a hospital uh, also also on a level, let's say, of uh, um, timestamps on uh, operation room attendance or something which is even not related to patients' data. I would say, uh, uh, I think uh, in order to uh, protect themselves, I would say, let's say, uh, particularly state institutions, uh, mm -hmm. being the hospitals, uh, they tend to overly in, uh, interpret uh, these regulations overly protective uh, mode that prevents actually both uh, research institutions and also startups access some open data, which could be possibly open data sets uh, in an anonymized way uh, that uh, actually slows down uh, some uh, development activities uh, and emergence uh, of technologies. Slows down innovation. Theo, exactly. any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I will agree with that. Um, I think that I believe in security and trust. Uh, I believe that uh, the customer, the client, uh, needs to feel uh, trust towards the company that handles the, their data. Um, we have seen in the past a few companies that have abused the trust and have used the data um, for their own gain. I believe that um, the regulation, as long as the regulation uh, keeps us uh, within uh, a path, within the path of innovation, um, it's okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. At uh, some point, uh, this changes, of course. But as long as, uh, as we keep innovating, is yeah, that's good. I think you all need the regulatory advisory boards to be with you, so you're not challenging them too much. That's yep. that's okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> totally fine. So thank you so much for uh, for being here, and I want to say to our listeners, right, thank you for joining. And if you want to be part of what you see here, you can always join into the discussion. Um, we have I, when you're interested to actually work with uh, transformative startups or uh, help them mentoring or do anything with pioneers or even maybe. Uh, invest in a groundbreaking startup, then feel free to reach out. You can always find us on all of our socials. That's called Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. Not sure how many people are still on Facebook, but I think they are, right? Uh, TikTok, whatever. So please find us and please subscribe to this uh, podcast of uh, Startup Spotlight. Thank you for being here. Thank you.